There's gotta be a reason why Lost Media has become the beloved niche that it has. There's the thrill of hunting for a mysterious thing, preserving pieces of media history, and the possible satisfaction of being able to successfully do so. Maybe you found out something you saw ages ago has been wiped off the face of the earth and you're determined to see it again. Or maybe you simply heard of something that's lost and the curiosity is consuming you and you're longing for it to be found. In order to help keep the lost media community thriving, it's important to give attention to the lost pieces that haven't been covered to death. R slash Lost Media is a wonderful place to find ongoing searches for lost media you may have never even heard of. Today we are going to be exploring that subreddit. We'll dive into some nostalgic, fascinating, and peculiar pieces of lost media. Let's get right into it. Fully Lost, Bear in the Big Blue House Live, a first time for everything. This came to my attention on the r slash Muppet subreddit and now I'm curious too. Bear in the Big Blue House Live, A First Time for Everything, was a live stage show that toured from 2002 to 2003. The official description of the show is as follows. The lovable cha-cha-cha dancing star of Jim Henson's Bear in the Big Blue House is singing and dancing his way to cities across the nation. Bear in the Big Blue House Live's A First Time for Everything is the all-new national touring production starring Bear and his puppet friends from the hit Disney Channel television show. Join in the fun as Bear is introduced to the Man family who get lost in Woodland Valley en route to their new home. This exhilarating live theater experience follows Bear and his friends, including Pippin Pop, Tutter, Ojo, and Trilo, on a journey of first-time feats and Bear welcomes every challenge with open paws. Celebrate beginners' triumphs with Bear and his friends, cheer on Tutter as he prepares for his first day of school, and encourage Ojo as she rides her first two-wheeler. A First Time for Everything features Bear Cha-Cha-Cha, Goodbye Song, and other hit songs from the Disney Channel television series. From the producers of Sesame Street Live, A First Time for Everything is an all new celebration of beginners' triumphs. As Bear says, it smells like fun. The only materials regarding it that seem to be available are a few screenshots, the list of songs, and the characters. Bear in the Big Blue House was a children's TV show that ran from 1997 until 2003. Eight additional episodes aired in 2006, then the show came to an end. Its concept was your typical teaching young children basic life lessons and other educational things that a child should learn about. I had the potty training VHS when I was a toddler, where Tutter, my personal favorite character, has to take a shit in the middle of playing checkers, then the episode goes on to teach children the basics of potty training. There's a good chance you've heard of the unreleased pilot that recently surfaced or some other lost history surrounding the show. There seems to be a substantial amount of Bear in the Big Blue House lore, especially within the lost media community, and today we're discussing this lost Bear in the Big Blue House live show. At the time of OP's post, there was no video evidence of its existence, but thankfully after making the post, someone was able to track down a British commercial advertising the tour, not only giving us video evidence to mark this as partially lost, but indicating it toured an England as well. This clip was posted to YouTube by Adrian Hodge, who said they found it in this Disney UK bumper compilation from 2003. As of today, this is all that has been found. While a typical plot for a children's show, I've always thought Bear in the Big Blue House had a special charm to it that not all kids' shows in a similar vein had. Looking back on it now, some of the charm is rather surreal. The character Shadow, for example, is pretty unnerving. The Sun in the Good Morning song and Luna who sings the goodbye song both have a very specific peculiar design to them that borders on freaky but this charm is not only creepy aspects tutter as i said favorite character makes his own beastie boy style song with pip and pop and is overall honestly hilarious bear begins each episode with sniffing you and saying that you smell good the set design feels cozy and the characters have fun distinct personalities in a way that makes these bizarre qualities more amusing than horrific i wanted to give this search for bear in the big blue house a first time for everything more attention because it's a piece of the show's history and deserves to be found. Tons of its lost media has already been recovered, so if gained enough traction, I am hopeful that we'll eventually be able to see this Bear in the Big Blue House live show with our own eyes. Partially Lost, unknown mid-80s song nicknamed Everyone Knows That. The other day I was casually browsing the internet 
this YouTube video had come up on my homepage, so of course, out of curiosity, I clicked it. The song sounded like something out of my childhood. I'm not an 80s kid, yet the song still jogged my memory. The memory of hearing this song in my childhood. In the description of the YouTube video was this link. It seemed some dude named Carl was looking for this song as well. A search had started but had quickly died down and Carl hasn't responded to any comments in the past year. Carl apparently lost interest in finding the song. Before Carl had stopped responding to messages, one person suggested the name of the song might be Caught Between Two Worlds by Sue Fink on her debut album titled Big Moment. I looked everywhere online to see if this was the song, but I was greeted with nothing. Only three of Sue Fink's songs from the album Big Moment had resurfaced online, and it wasn't the one I was looking for. As of right now, this is all the info I could find. I really want to get this song found and start a search again. The search for the identification of this song has been going on since October 2021, as far as I could tell. You can take a quick listen. This 17 second clip is all that we've got. The first comment on this post seemed like an extremely optimistic lead. The album is on eBay for a relatively cheap price. This can solve your mystery. But this user replied, the lyric sheet is included in the eBay posting, and based off that, I don't see any way that this tune is the right one. Personally, the voice sounds male to me. I didn't want to completely rule it out though. But three weeks ago, someone actually uploaded to YouTube this Sue Fink song, confirming it isn't everyone knows that. And every lead has essentially been a dead end. There's some helpful info to narrow down possibilities, but that's kind of it. Like, that it was recorded in Spain, therefore making it not possible that this Carl guy heard it on MTV, as MTV Spain didn't launch until late 2000. And this user commented, I think we determined the synth in the song to be a sequential Prophet 5, and the drum machine a Lindrum. This also puts the song as being made between 1982 and 1999, since the Lindrum was released in 1982, and the clip was recorded in 1999 per Carl the OP. A common theory is that this is from a commercial, but if that were true, the question still stands, what commercial was it from? The lyrics indicate nothing about advertising any kind of product, so that makes it difficult to find. And since the lyrics don't relate to advertising anything, some people think this theory isn't the answer behind the song. User LunarBliss07, in another thread discussing the lost song, saw a YouTube comment of someone saying they were remember hearing it as a child in Russia, but like everyone had heard the mysterious song too, so I think recalling memories of hearing these lost songs usually isn't the most reliable way to go about finding them. There is a longer, more in-depth timeline to the search, but I wanted to go over the more important details because the in-depth story is just running around in circles and dead ends, so I honestly didn't see the point because it's pretty unsatisfying. It does have some similar mysterious song energy though that makes you feel like you've heard it before. This user said, This tune in particular always fascinated me. Me. I don't know if it's because of my love for 80s music or just the overall nostalgic vibe I get, like, oh wow, that sounds familiar, or just a mix of both. Anyway, I think it's cool there's still people out there who are just as avid as me on hoping the fool is found someday. It's so weird to think how it's just lost to time for now. Hopefully soon, something will turn up. I sincerely hope so as well. In 2000, a Waluigi Flash game was made likely to advertise the character's introduction in Mario Tennis N64, Waluigi's Toenail Clipping Party. There doesn't seem to be a functioning version anywhere. OP posted an image of a Nintendo Power article where it states, It seems that everyone's favorite mustachioed mischief maker has let his personal grooming go, and it's up to you to help him. Clip those nails good, and be sure to aim for the jar or you'll be left with ragged clippings and toe jam all over your hard drive. User Sako the Hamster commented, I'm gonna approve this one for the sheer hilarity of it, but I'm gonna tell you that this was most likely 100% satire on the magazine's behalf to make a joke about Waluigi. While the website most likely existed, I don't believe the game actually did. If this ends up being found though, that's hilarious. 
But despite it seeming like this was a satirical Waluigi article, there's very compelling evidence that shows Waluigi's toenail clipping party did in fact exist and this was no joke. The first piece of evidence is this GameFAQs forum from 10 years ago of people reminiscing about clipping Waluigi's toenails and they're no luck in finding it. Since if you looked up MarioTennis.com, it just redirected to the 3DS Mario Tennis open website. The next piece of evidence gathered was this 2011 article about Waluigi's absence in Mario Kart 7, where the author went over the history of Waluigi. This excerpt reads, Waluigi was first conceived by Camelot when developing Mario Tennis for the Nintendo 64. They figured that since Mario had a bizarro version in Wario, Luigi could also use a freakish clone of his own. And thus, Wario and Luigi were introduced as partners in crime, hoping to take out Mario and Luigi for good at tennis at least. Mario Tennis was heavily advertised as the debut of Waluigi who was prominently featured in the game's intro and throughout the marketing campaign, including a flash mini game on the Mario Tennis website where you could clip Waluigi's toenails and collect the clippings in a jar. Classy marketing right there. You still could say these are random people on the internet that are talking about Waluigi's feet. That isn't evidence. But lastly, we have toenailscoming.swf that was archived via way back and will lead you to this. Waluigi's foot fault. Grab your shears and collect a jar full of smelly toenails clipped off Waluigi's monstrous feet. The fungus is about to begin, coming soon. The Waluigi toenail game is real and it very well may be out there. Three other SWF file URLs were found on MarioTennis.com, being toenails, paint the lines, and deface painting. Unfortunately, none of those were archived, and all we have for now is this coming soon promo. It being a flash game obviously makes it significantly harder to find, but nowhere near impossible. Take Monkey Ball, for example, the franchise has a massive lost media history, including Flash games, some of which resurfaced, and there's still people searching for the few remaining lost pieces of its history. So I think it's just a matter of getting the right attention and ending up at the right place on the internet. And I wanna say that I am confident at some point, we will get to clip Waluigi's toenails ourselves. Fully Lost. Wizards of Waverly Place Pilot, 2006-2007. I'm here to discuss the Wizards of Waverly Place Lost Pilot. I assume that this pilot was filmed in late 2006 or early 2007, and it had all the main cast members minus Max Russo, and the actor who played Jerry before David DeLuise is currently unknown at the moment. Alex and Justin's names were meant to be Jordan and Julia, and the sub shop was meant to be a magic shop. Dallas Lovato, Demi Lovato's older sister, played a love interest for Jordan, later known as Justin in the official series. Brandon Michael Smith of Sunny with a Chance was Justin's best friend on the unaired pilot, and Chelsea Kane played a character named Rachel, but was also scrapped. Chelsea would still appear on Wizards during the baseball episode. The creator said he would release the unaired pilot back in 2017, but as of now, nothing has come of note. I'm quite surprised that this search never caught on as well because it was mega popular and launched the acting and music career of Selena Gomez. And if this search catches on, in and outside the Lost Media community, I'm sure it'll be released somehow. Those of you watching that are around my age or have a child or relative my age, I'm sure remember the beloved Wizards of Waverly Place. The Disney show following Selena Gomez as Alex Russo and her journey of being a wizard with her wizard siblings and mortal parents. They get into some kind of magical pickle every episode while also managing a sub shop that, as stated in the Reddit post, was a magic shop in this unreleased pilot. The only current remains of the pilot are a photo that Chelsea Kane posted to her Instagram of the original cast members on set, and a video David Henry posted of the script where we can see the original title was The Amazing O'Malley's, confirmation of the cast, the magic shop detail, and adds that Justin and Alex were twins instead of only siblings. This user commented on the thread, Stranger things have happened, my mate. If the alien ending to Ned's Declassified was found, so can this pilot. I suspect there still might be some copyright issues from Disney that prevent the creator from showing us the original pilot rather than have it get released or something, like a DVD compilation or complete season set of the show. Objective Zombie 448 said the creator, Todd J. Greenwald, was doing a Q&A on Twitter, and they had asked him a question regarding the pilot. 
they were just hoping for a response. Shortly after making this comment, the user updated us with saying Todd responded to their question with this. Uh, I wrote the lost pilot. It's lost in a folder on my MacBook. I've thought about it. No Macs, different dad. Not a sub shop, but a traditional magic shop. Alex and Justin were named Julia and Jordan. Dallas Lovato had a guest starring role. Objective Zombie 448 added how while this confirms already known or speculated facts, it doesn't confirm whether or not the pilot ever went past the script stage. So they asked him that as well, to learn that this pilot was produced. Jennifer Stone, the actress that played Harper, and David DeLuise, who played Jerry, started a podcast together in February of this year titled Wizards of Waverly Pod, where they rewatch the episodes and take a bunch of trips down memory lane, recalling past experiences and more. They briefly talked about this unreleased pilot in the first episode of the podcast. An interesting detail is that while being in the pilot, Jennifer Stone mentioned how she had never actually seen it herself. The release of this podcast prompted another user, sorry about last night, to make another post about the lost pilot, just going over everything we know so far. User Infinite Stripes 95 commented on this post with, David said on the newer podcast, he thinks he has a DVD of the original pilot, that was given to him when he signed on for Wizards, which makes me think it's possible other people out there have a DVD. Was it maybe sent out to network people slash other actors, etc. Then added a second comment. He said he's going to try to find it to show to Jennifer. Maybe fans can persuade him to leak it if he does, lol. Objective Zombie 448 from the original thread came over to this one with a bit of a hopeless update. Todd J. Greenweld posted that he has the DVD with not only the unaired pilot, but four seasons of bloopers, but then he deleted it as soon as it gained traction and posted, I had the wizard stuff you really want to see. Original pilot, four seasons of bloopers, and delicious tea nobody knows but the writers. Note, we were a family and what happens in the fam stays in the fam. So not a great sign. This is probably a matter of getting someone who owns a copy to release it. I'd assume David DeLuise is our best bet. Otherwise, we're likely to never see the pilot. But as this user said, the Alien Ned's Declassified episode was found, so I still have hope we can get this pilot released somehow. How to Make the Cruelest Month, 1998. How to Make the Cruelest Month is a film that was released in 1998 and shown at Sundance Film Festival. Little is known about it besides its synopsis and a few articles from around when it was released. A guy I used to be friends with asked James Duvall about it, who was in it, and he didn't have much of a clue either. Help finding this movie. OP then linked to the movie's IMDb page where we can see it had a runtime of an hour and 39 minutes. It stars Clea Duval as the protagonist named Belle, other cast members, the director slash writer, and a summary of Bright Neurotic Belle sets two goals for New Year to quit smoking and to fall in love. As the first task turns out to be too difficult, she puts all her energy into the second. I've really liked the faculty ever since I first saw it when I was a kid, and the whole horror revival that Scream influenced is one of my favorite eras of film. Final Destination is honestly probably my favorite movie. And you know, sometimes you can't help but enjoy a late 90s teen rom-com. So that makes this a lost piece of media that I'd love to be able to see. OP made a second post shortly after with a poster of the film as well, but neither of the posts garnered much attention. Most of the comments are debating if it is considered lost media, since there is somewhat proof that at some point, a DVD of the movie was sold on eBay. We'll get into that in a minute. But users were saying how it's really just a matter of hoping another shows up, so can we consider it lost? In response to someone saying it's more unavailable than lost, user ZeppelinDude93 said, I find this comes up from time to time and Honestly, I don't see a difference. Media that isn't available is essentially lost. To the average person, the difference is inconsequential. I agree with this for the most part. Clockman, for example, is literally the r slash media icon, but it basically started as a tip of my tongue style thing, then homie was found on YouTube. Now, some of the people in the subreddit say that that makes something not lost media, so it's kind of confusing. Lost media is a very broad term in my opinion, and I honestly don't like super restrictive stipulations on what makes media lost because I feel it brings too much confusion and debate. If there's a group of people searching for something and it isn't found, it stands as lost. At least it's how I feel about this movie and there's nothing on the internet that suggests it's ever shown up for sale besides once in 2004. On a Clea Duval forum in February of 2004, 
Someone said the movie was currently up on eBay and even mentioned how there was only one online since copies were given to few select people. They wanted to bid but were unfortunately unable to afford it. But this user on the forum bought the movie and was going to make copies of it to share with the other users. On February 18th, 2004, they said, My copy of the movie arrived today. I will make copies tomorrow. It will cost you £15 for the CDRs. Email me if you are interested and linked an email. I did send an email just in case but I feel like there's no way no one else already did that and I'm sure this email isn't even associated with them anymore. On the same thread though, I found the eBay link to the listing. The eBay link was not archived on my back. It also was not archived on eBay itself because I searched the item number via the link and nothing showed up. I couldn't find it by searching the movie title or Clea Duval on Worth Point either. Searching the title with eBay only brings you to the forum. The person who purchased it left their eBay username, but the account isn't registered anymore, so no one can contact them. This appears to be entirely a dead end lead, but at least lets us know there is a chance it could show up for sale again. This Lost Media wiki post goes over every lead in their dead ends. The only other things I could find are articles reviewing the film and a few images that are supposedly screen caps of it. For this to resurface, we're either gonna have to manifest a copy onto eBay or successfully contact someone who still has a copy and is willing to share it. But we found more difficult things, so I think there's a decent chance we'll be able to watch this movie someday. two-hour tape containing mysterious lost media published by Famous Band. A band named Boards of Canada has recently released a two-hour tape full of mysterious songs under the name Societas X Tape. After the tape was published, there has been large efforts from the community to find the sources of said songs, but some still remain unknown. You can listen to the tape here and follow the search efforts here, with the unknown ones being marked by a question mark. It is very possible that some of these have not been digitized and as a result lost. Please help us find the missing songs. So See It As X Tape is a mixtape that Boards of Canada broadcasted on NTS Radio on June 23, 2019. NTS described the mix as a two-hour selection of mind-melting offbeat psychedelia. It consists mostly of works from other artists and even clips of commercials like a swine flu PSA from the 70s. It's really fascinating if Boards of Canada or obscure blue chin era media are your thing. This is by far one of the most interesting cases of lost media for me for a few different reasons. I found Boards of Canada when I was around 11 through David Firth, who has been a huge creative inspiration for me for almost half my life now, and y'all know how much Boards of Canada I use as background music. Second reason being, I love Lost Wave, the musical side of Lost Media. My video about the search for an unidentified song is definitely one of my favorite videos I've made so far. And lastly, this is actually a piece of mysterious song lore. When Wang made his first video on the subject matter back in 2019 and the search gained popularity, people noticed a song featured in this mixtape sounded strikingly similar to the mysterious song band, especially the vocalist. At the time, that song was unidentified and it was one of the OG leads on the subreddit. This was eventually identified as Strangers by Sinking Ships. Not the mysterious song, but it was a mystery that was solved. Despite being released nearly four years ago and search efforts made, multiple songs on the mixtape remain unidentified, seven to be exact. I'm going to play a short snippet of each song so you know which ones are lost. It'll probably end up being around a minute in total, so I'll put a timestamp here in case you don't want to sit through it, but the songs are cool, so you should. Here they are. Thank you. 
The entire mix produces so many feelings of nostalgia for places you have been and places that don't even exist, and such a specific aura regardless of how much some of the tunes vary musically. They gathered all these tracks and clips into this perfectly curated atmospheric thing that I think accurately depicts the abundance of ways music can make us feel. And the mystery surrounding it makes it all the more intriguing. Even the band on the cover was a mystery at one point, but was eventually identified as a 70s photograph of the band Cement, Gravel, and Rock Company playing at the Tomorrowland Terrace in Disneyland. There is the theory that some of the identified tracks are unreleased Words of Canada songs, which is a whole other thing of lost media. It's a very pleasant rabbit hole to dive into, but most people think they are from different artists that just haven't been found yet. I haven't seen this discussed all that much within the Lost Media community. The post from the subreddit didn't even have a single comment, so I wanted to give it more spotlight because it's great music and a great mystery. I hope the search continues and that more pieces of media history can be found. I briefly mentioned earlier the definition of lost media is pretty much a debate. Now, if you don't think obscure deleted YouTube poops or not being able to find something you remember is lost media, I don't blame you. But everything is important to someone out there in the world. And I guess I think creating all these stipulations can almost diminish the sentimentality of lost media. If multiple people put in an effort to search for something and it's nowhere to be found, it's safe to say that it's currently lost and that's my definition of it but it's different for different people. I think we can all agree on how it's incredibly rewarding to solve a lost media case and compelling to hunt down or just soak in the mystery of it all. Because whether it's found or not, it's genuinely a captivating phenomenon. I'm here to bring limelight to some that I think really deserve it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I loved being able to compile some more of my personal favorites again. In the future, we may be lucky enough to say that these are not lost anymore, or they may stay in the lost media abyss forever. Either way, Thank you.